and I will start the session up in about 10 seconds. Three, two, one. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Um, welcome to the DPA Fundamentals Virtual Chapter Meeting for October. Uh, today's presentation is Common SQL Server Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. It's going to be presented by Tim Radney. Uh, he's with SQL Skills, and really I don't need to say much more than that because they're one of the best in the business. I'll be turning things over to Tim in a minute, but I want to announce bring to you a few announcements um, oh first of all my name is Steve Cantrell I'm the chapter co-vice president um, but we have a new sponsor actually it's our first sponsor it's SQL Sentry um, if you're new to the SQL world or if you, you you're not you've probably heard of them before uh, they're the company that has created Plan Explorer which is a fantastic tool that you can download for free that helps in reading execution plans. Um, if you try to do execution plans with SSMS, it, if, the, if the, the query is even past intermediate, uh, it sometimes gets to the point where you can't tell what's going on. Um, Plan Explorer simplifies that dramatically uh, and gives you so much more functionality, the free version. You've got a free version you can download anytime you want to. But um, as part of an introduction, um, SQL Sentry is going to be giving away uh, three professional versions of Plan Explorer. We're going to give them away over the next three months. If you uh, attend any of our sessions in October, um, either ones that we give in the U.S. or the ones that, will, that are being given in Australia, uh, you'll be entered into the drawing to win a free professional version. Same thing in November and the same thing in December. And with our new sponsorship, we're able to give away uh, more money than the $25 a session that we were giving away, but we've decided to kind of build it up and over the course of three months give away $300 uh, around Christmas. Uh, so um, every session that you attend increases your chances um, and we'll be uh, giving it away sometime in the middle of December. If you would like to download a free copy of Plan Explorer, uh, go to www.sqlcentry.com, S-Q-L-S-E-N-T-R-Y.com. They have a whole host of other products, but for our purposes, to start with, go ahead and download a copy and play with it. You'll, you'll love it, uh, and you may win a professional version. Okay. Up next for DBA Fundamentals, um, in Australia, we have a session that's SQL Server on Flash, Rethinking Best Practices by Jimmy May. That will be an interesting one. That will be on October the, tw uh, the 12th. Actually, October the 13th is when they'll have it. But if you want to watch it from the U.S., um, Central Standard Time will be 9.30 p.m. on December the 12th. Or I'm sorry. <laughs> October the 12th, uh, the night before. Eastern will be 10.30. Uh, their, their next session, which is a good one, Big Data and Hadoop, uh, Cindy Gross will be giving that one, uh, will be on November the 10th. Their date and time um, will be a, uh, 12.30. In the U.S., it'll be 9.30 Central uh, Daylight Time. And then a session here in the U.S. Um, in November will be Know Your Roles uh, by Robert Burrell. That's a very good session uh, that I've heard before. Uh, actually, he's a local guy here in Nashville that um, does an in-depth um, presentation on uh, security roles. And if you're a new DBA or even an intermediate DBA, there's always more you can learn from that. Okay, if you're signing up for PASS, um, at this last minute, passes in uh, at the end of the month, uh, 1027 through 1030. Be sure and use our discount code, which is uh, VC15GBQ6, or every other virtual chapter or local chapter has the same discount code. Save yourself that $150 because it's going to be expensive at this point. 
hopefully we'll see you there. We'll be, uh, there'll be two of us going to pass this year. Um, virtual chapters, uh, there's tons of other virtual chapters besides ours. Uh, virtualization, performance, security, uh, the DBA chapter that gives more advanced sessions than we do. The data architecture, they've got a great one coming up after this session. Big data, just go, go to sqlpass.org and check them out. Uh, in fact, there's one right after our session today uh, that Ryan Adams is giving called install an always own failover cluster uh, and availability group. Uh, that's something that I want to learn more about. I think that'll be a great one to go to. Uh, I've signed up for it. Now, if I miss part of it uh, from this session, which I probably will, um, it's recorded like ours. Ours were recorded and they're usually available within two or three days and pretty well every chapter does the same thing. So even if you can't make it to sessions, go ahead and sign up and uh, you can watch it. Uh, it. A lot of the chapters load them up to YouTube. There's a great one coming up uh, in November, Reading Query Plans with Grant Fritchie uh, from the Data Architecture Group. Um, you can utilize, if you go ahead and download Plan Explorer, you can utilize it during that presentation to go along with him. Uh, the virtualization, virtualization chapter has got a really good one coming out in November, planning for virtualization. There's always great topics out there. As I said before, this session is recorded and it'll be available in our archive session in no less than a week. Usually we can get things up there in two or three days at the very least um, and Tim or the speaker usually will get us the slides and um, any scripts that they use during the presentation and we'll post those also. Okay, that's all the housekeeping I can think of. Uh, you don't really really listen to me, but I'm going to turn it over to Tim now and let him continue. Um, well, let me give a brief introduction. Being with SQL Skills, if you know anything about that group, they're fantastic teachers and fantastic presenters. If Tim's with them, you know he's great, uh, but he's he started with them this year. He's a principal consultant there. He's worked with SQL Server for the past 15 years, and um, I'm just going to turn it over to him now. All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, so this talk is Common SQL Server Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. I've presented this to various uh, user groups, SQL um, Saturdays, um, 24 hours of pass. Um, I, I really like this talk because I get to consolidate about three years of accidental DBA learning things into a little 60-minute you know, presentation. So we'll, ahead and, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as Steve said, I am with SQL Skills. Uh, we're a team of world-renowned SQL Server experts such as Paul Randall, Kimberly Tripp, Glenn Berry, Aaron Stiletto, Jonathan Cahayas, and myself. Uh, Steve mentioned the instructor-led training. Uh, I believe we have a, a class going on next week in uh, Ireland. Uh, we do a lot on Pluralsight. Uh, with our consulting business, Health Checks, um, covering you know, hardware performance, you know, upgrades, migrations, uh, pretty much anything with the storage engine you know, we, we handle. We also provide remote DBA you know, services where we can you know, monitor your systems and troubleshoot things as they come up. Uh, we speak at you know, conferences all over, such as the PASS Summit um, and SQL Intersection, which are head-to-head -head at the end of the month. Uh, so uh, look in the skies, you'll see SQL Skills people flying between Vegas and Seattle to uh, be present at uh, both conferences. I would like to encourage everyone, if you're not already a SQL Skills Insider, uh, just go to sqlskills.com forward slash insider, provide your email address. Paul sends out a newsletter about twice a month with lots of tidbits and, and cool things uh, regarding SQL Server. We always have an uh, insider video, which is anywhere from three to, to six or minutes or so, of how to do some cool little trick or th uh, something within you know, SQL Server. Uh, so it's just packed full of SQL goodness, and it's free. <clears throat> Uh, here's kind of a, a quick rundown of some of the immersion events. Um, we have IE0, which is for the Junior Accidental DBA, a really great course. Uh, two weeks of training on performance tuning and then one on uh, HADR. Uh, that particular one kind of changed my life and career when I attended it uh, several years ago. And then we have an immersion event on business intelligence, um, which will now be uh, taught by Andy Leonard and Tim Mitchell. Um, so uh, we'll proceed. So a little about me, here's all my contact information. I do like to uh, 
kind of broadcast. If you're attending one of my sessions, your emails are free. I mean, if you have a question, uh, need some guidance, some uh, confirmation on something, feel free to email me, tim at sqlskills.com. You know, I blog, I'm on Twitter, um, those kinds of things. Uh, kind of the cool takeaway here is I'm, I'm kind of into electronics. I like to play with my son with some Arduinos and robotic stuff, but I do aquaponics and I farm chickens and tilapia. So the little trivia question about Tim. I mentioned plural site. Uh, all of us you know, offer this. If you'll email Paul at sqlskills.com in the subject line, put user group, he'll send you a, uh, a code. Uh, there's no credit card, no catches, no, no nothing. Just provide, um, uh, just email Paul, he'll send you a code. You can use that to register at pluralsite.com and you get a 30 day free trial of all the SQL Skills content. Um, we really leverage you know, Pluralsight for some of our training and you know, reference materials and stuff. Being able to go into a deeper dive into you know, some of Paul's courses like the weights, latches, and spin locks, um, Kimberly on performance tuning with a you know, stored procedure performance tuning. Glenn has a three-part course on DMVs. I mean, there's just not enough time in our sessions to cover this stuff, so they're able to just free form, you know, go through, create these courses, and you get 30 days um, to go and, and view them all for free. Even after that, Pluralsight is really inexpensive. If you don't have a subscription, kind of have to question why not. So what am I going to talk about today? We're going to cover backups, consistency checks, log cleanup, statistics, index maintenance, memory settings, max degree of parallelism and cost threshold parallelism, tempdb, SQL Server alerts, and power savings. I do health checks for companies you know, big and small. I've been doing it for quite a few years, and I consistently see the same things you know, not done. And I think a large portion of the reason that some of the things are not done is a lot of SQL Server installations are performed by um, application developers, systems engineers. You know, they're not production DBAs. So they'll do a next, next, next finish. And you know, if it's not done out of the box, well, it's not being performed in their environment. And over time, things start to get slow. And then they have problems and they, they call a consultant or they start reading blog posts. So let's talk about backups. Do you have recent backups? That's one of the first things that we look at. And you know, if you have backups, are the backups adequate for your environment? All too many times I'll find a database that's in simple recovery um, model, and it's their mission critical database. We know if it's in simple, unless they're doing differential backups every 15 minutes, you know, they're probably just doing nightly fulls, and uh, they'll have up to 24 hours of data loss if something happens. So we need to make sure that you know, yourself, your clients, and whomever you're supporting you know, has a, uh, that they're planning their restore strategy to meet their service, service level agreements. Your recovery point objective and your recovery time objective will dictate your backup strategy. So if you need point in time up to 15 minutes of data loss, you're typically going to see transaction log backups of every 15 minutes. So depending on the type of backups that you need to take, we'll determine the recovery model that you need. Are you validating your backups? The absolutely best method to validate backups is by restoring them. You know, do you have a dedicated environment built where you're regularly restoring your backups? You know, if you're not, I mean, it's so cheap and inexpensive to go in and build this out. I've seen blog posts where people have shared C Sharp code, PowerShell, uh, you name it, it's out there for implementing a system to regularly restore your backups. A bank that I used to work at, you know, we did this. And when regulators and examiners, auditors would come in and question you know, our backup and recovery methodologies for our SQL Server environment, we were able to show them that uh, tw at least twice a month we're restoring every production database, how long it took, you know, things like that. So we produced these reports and they typically, the, the examiners and auditors kind of left us alone. This also helped us by checking, you know, having the process, if we didn't have a backup of a system, you know, we would know it. If we had corruption in the backup, you know, well, the backup file. If someone went and removed a backup, so the server backups were occurring, but for whatever reason they went and excluded a certain database and forgot to remove the exclusion. So there's safety measures that can, but doing this restore validation can help you find. Now wrote a, um, or kind of piece together a backup script 
or a, a, a script that will check for backups. If you go to timrandy.com forward slash backups, this script will uh, return the recovery model or the database name, the recovery model, the last full, the last differential, and the last two transaction log backups. Why I like this script is I can see what the, uh, the backup uh, schedule is for the transaction logs. I'm getting the recovery model so I can see if it's in simple and it um, only has full backups, no log backups. There's a lot of things that you can piece together you know, off of this one script. And it's super easy. I can email it to a client. They can you know, run it or um, you know, someone just hit me up off of a blog post. You know, this is a great script to, to send to them that we can then look at and see kind of where their gaps are in their, their backup routines. Next, you know, consistency checks. Now, I will say that most clients that I work with, you know, they have some form of backups that were, were taking place. It might not be the best. They may have gaps you know, in them, but they've made a best effort to, to be backing up. I mean, we know this as application engineers, systems administrators. You know, we know that backups are good. What I find a lot is consistency checks not being ran at all because people just don't know about it if they're not DBAs. You know, corruption happens. An I.O. subsystem error, you know, problem is 99.98% of the uh, you know, corruption-causing event out there. 0.01% could be local hardware, and again, and uh, a 0.01% as a SQL Server bug. I really haven't seen you know, many bugs recently uh, within SQL Server that cause corruption. You know, SQL Server uh, 6570 2000, yeah, um, but there, there's been very few occurrences. Um, and in recent uh, revisions of SQL Server. So how do you find corruption? You need to run CheckDB. Uh, you, there's, you can run just check alloc to check your allocation tables. You can check just the catalog. You can check individual file groups. Now, I like the ability to just check individual file groups if I'm dealing with very large databases and I've partitioned the data into, say, yearly file groups. And the old stuff I've already backed up. I've restored a copy. I know that it's good. <clears throat> then I can just focus on uh, checking the, the primary file group. But, you know, outside of that, I mean, corruption being found would be by an end user trying to access data that's corrupt. Um, at that point, it's probably too late for you to do anything about it uh, to recover the data. A lot of the times, the way that you're going to recover from a database corruption is a restore. So you need to be running CheckDB fairly often so that if you detect the corruption, you still have valid backups that you can go back to to retrieve the data. <clears throat> Sometimes you get lucky the corruption is in a non-clustered index where you can just rebuild the clustered index, but if it's in the heap or it's the clustered index, then chances are you're going to be restoring that data. So if you're only running CheckDB once a month and you're keeping your, your full backups two weeks, you've got a serious gap there. Tim, yes. Um, I've heard people talk about this before, and, and we haven't really started doing that, but I think we should. Uh, you talked about restoring your backups to another server somewhere just to validate that they'll restore. Mm -hmm. What would we lose uh, by running DBCC checks on the server after that, after the data is restored mm -hmm. on a different yes. server? So great, great um, point there. If you're doing a restore validation fairly re, you know, quickly, so uh, you know, to a, a, another server, you can offload CheckDB to another server if you're restoring your databases. I've seen some people reference that with availability groups or read-only um, uh, uh, secondaries, running CheckDB there. Well, corruption happens 99.98% you know, at the I.O. subsystem level. It's not a transactional operation. So if you're doing log shipping, mirroring, uh, availability group you know, type stuff, that I.O. subsystem corruption isn't going to replicate to your secondary. The way that you would you know, offload CheckDB is restoring your most recent full differential transaction logs up to a point in time, running CheckDB on a secondary system, because you know, SQL Server you know, can back up a corrupt database. So that's a good way of... Uh, offloading that from your primary systems if you, know, you just really don't have the maintenance window to take the IO hit there. Uh, absolutely, you can restore it to another server, run CheckDB there. Do you lose anything at all if you're running the DBCC checks on another 
system because we're we're thinking of doing that because we've got a lot of it, it's DBCC is really an intense uh, thing and we try to do it every day but with our replication software giving us problems whenever it resyncs it, it really slows the system down but um, we I'm I guess I'm just really interested in if I lose anything in doing that now, the, the only thing I could think of is if the the error is in memory you know that that may not that wouldn't show up on a restored you know copy but the way that you would eliminate that uh, you know, in memory error is detaching reattach from the database or restarting the instance uh, so so checking for physical you know corruption I I can't think of anything I can run that back by Paul uh, but you no know, I mean we we highly encourage and and you educate that yeah you can offload CheckDB to a secondary server with restoring databases so I think if there was any major caveat there would be major disclaimers in those statements and I've never seen them okay uh, as far as handling questions we've got some questions coming in do you want to answer them now or do you want to wait uh, we, we can take a couple now okay um, this one user wants to know uh, thoughts on when bulk copy best uh, what their best practices to do bulk copy how does it impact point in time restores this is back to the when you were talking about backups and restores yeah so when you switch and do bulk copy uh, let me take that one after because uh, okay. that, that can that can take a while to to go into okay um, and this is definitely I know you said pretty often and I know it's different per uh, location but they want to know how frequently should DBCC be run daily weekly monthly it depends uh, it, probably it depends well I mean it, it does depend I like to, to kind of say no less than once a week you know, if you have a small system and fast storage and you can handle and you have the maintenance window to do it you know, every day um, by all means you know, it, 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 that would be okay uh, but typically I see most clients once a week uh, running CheckDB, and then they keep their backups for anywhere from two to three weeks. Um, you know, the risk, I mean, what's the likelihood that data is going to be written, it's going to be corrupt during the, say, 15-minute window that you're doing log backups? And again, it's typically the I.O. subsystem that's going to corrupt something, so it, it was transactionally consistent when it was written to the log, so as long as you have your log backups, you, know, you can still get that data back. So once a week is typically the safest. If you're doing once a month because it's a large database, then unless you're keeping those backups for a longer period of time and you you, you have that maintenance, I mean, you know, at, at what point are you going to have to roll the database to to get the data back and then trying to piece it back together? I mean, it really complicates things when you're dealing with a month's worth of potential data. You're know, trying to recover that uh, you know, from the corruption. So, you know, again, you know, once a week, but like you said, it, it kind of depends on the environment, but for the most part, you know, once a week is what I like to see. Okay. Um, are there special considerations for DBCC checks with system databases? I still run them. I, I run them on master model and MSDB. Okay. Um, I'll read this one. I think it's a little bit of what I was talking about. I've heard that even if DBCC CheckDB is on a database restored to a second server, you should still run a physical only on the production server, true or not? AGs, I would say yes, uh, but if you're, if you're doing it on the you know, primary database server, you're restoring to a secondary, running CheckDB, I mean, you've validated that data from that backup is consistent. I mean, Okay. Um, I'm not sure about these. I'll ask the user a little bit more, but go ahead and go on. I'll, I've All got right. another one that I'll try to figure out what they're asking. All right. So one of the next things <clears throat> in looking at, at servers, um, I see that you know, people aren't purging logs on a regular basis. Uh, MSDB stores all backup and restore history. So if you have a, a log chip secondary, I mean, you know, it's going to have a, a lot of restore history. Your primary is going to have a lot of backup history. And this data is not purged automatically. I have encountered MSDB databases that are 18 gig in size from 17 and a half gig worth of backup history data. You know, a, a slow non you know, MSDB it can have you know, some significant impact. Uh, I can't remember who it was, but they had written a blog post that uh, 
just having a bloated MSDB for backup history caused a set of a backup job to expand from running in an hour and a half or something like that to over six hours just because of the, the reads and writes into MSDB. So the way that you can purge MSDB is executing sp underscore delete underscore backup history and then you want to pass it uh, the date that you want to delete all the history you know, afterwards. So the, the script I have up here passing it January 1st, 2005, anything older than January 1st, 2000, excuse me, 2015, anything older than uh, January 1st, 2015 would be deleted. So you can easily script this into a job where you're just uh, declaring an, uh, a date time new variable, passing the variable into um, uh, the stored procedure, and it's done. Uh, if you've never ran this, it could take a while the first time, uh, so you may want to kind of start if you have seven years worth of history, kind of maybe do it in six months, you know, chunks to, to prune MSDB <clears throat> and then just let the job, you know, kind of run. And typically I see anything from 30 to 90 days worth of history being kept. Uh, you don't need your backup history in order to restore a database, but it is kind of nice to have a little bit of backup history to be able to go and, and look and show examiners and things that, you know, hey, we have been backing up. Uh, but outside of that, I mean, you, it's not really, you know, uh, a requirement unless it's an audit requirement, in which case you can archive the stuff and then, then purge it. You just want to get it out of um, MSTB. SQL Server log maintenance. If you've ever been like me and you, you get on a, uh, a server and you try to go and look at the SQL Server log and it takes 25 minutes to kind of load and it's got a billion records and the log hasn't been reset in eight months, uh, you know, it's very annoying, and then you try to go and apply a filter, and you get to, it kind of resets that, that time, you have to wait again. By default, your log only rolls over when the service is restarted. So if you're not patching your server once a month, you know, if it's up for six months at a time, that can be a lot of events stored in the, in the error log. So you want to execute sp underscore cycle underscore error log. That starts a new log. You can set this again as a, a daily job to say run at midnight, and so every night you have a new log that begins, and it really helps with troubleshooting because now you can get just go and choose you know, one log or three, four, however many days that you want to look at, and it's a lot easier to kind of apply filters and try to troubleshoot to find when an error occurred because we're typically typically not trying to look at what happened 45 days ago. We're trying to look at what happened last night, past few hours, past couple of days. By default. SQL Server keeps six uh, version or six additional uh, versions of the log, so the six oldest and the current, so you have seven. So if you're resetting on a daily basis, then seven might not be enough. Uh, so you can increase that to some other number up to 99. You know, 30 is pretty good. 40, 45. Um, if you've been like me, you get on a on a server and you look, and they re you know, the server was rebooted like 10 times in a row trying to fix a problem. And if you only had seven logs, then you've got maybe 30, 40 minutes worth of you know, logs from all those restarts. Uh, so keeping you know, 30 to 45 is good. You know, just whatever you feel comfortable to keep a, at least a minimum of 30 days worth of the, worth of the logs for troubleshooting um, is recommended. So again, MSDB, you need to prune it, and your SQL Server log, you know, set it to kind of start a new log you know, daily um, and try to have about 30 days worth. Something else that I typically don't see uh, you know, occurring is keeping statistics up to date. And we are fortunate that we do have auto-update statistics that is enabled by default uh, when you install SQL Server. However, it's not all that great that 20% of the data plus 500 rows have to change before auto-update statistics kick in. Now, there is a trace flag you can enable to decrease that, and I've uh, seen some stuff with 2016. They're kind of lowering the number. Uh, however, we're not all on 2016 yet, and you know, I, I still don't like to rely on auto-update statistics to keep my statistics up to date. You need a process to manually update these, and the reason being is the query optimizer uses st statistics to build the execution plans. So if you're dealing with old data, then it's not going to potentially form the, the good enough plan to, to get you to your data. It's kind of like if one kid comes up you know, yelling at you that something happened and then you make a decision to discipline the other child without having the whole story, you're probably you know, um, 
grounding a, a child that's innocent, you know, because there's, there's three sides to that story, you know, kid A, kid B, and the truth. Um, so similar with, with uh, SQL Server and statistics, you know, it needs to have all the information, you know, good stats, good information to build the plan. So how do we do this? Uh, Ola Halligren has an excellent process for updating statistics. Uh, you can kind of roll your own with SP underscore update stats. Um, and you know, there, there's you know, probably other, you know, other third-party tools, but what I like is you know, Ola's process it has a, a full maintenance solution with the index optimization. You can tell it you know, update statistics equals, I think it's yes, um, and then you know, it kind of just takes care of it for you. But without updating your statistics, you're likely to be getting um, inefficient plans, which can cause all kind of you know, bad things from higher CPU util utilization, more disk I.O., because uh, it's having to read more data. Um, so you want to make sure that statistics, you're doing something to them uh, on a, uh, updating you know, daily, you know, weekly. Um, if you, it's low impactful to, to update them for the most part. Um, so I like to see it daily. Tim, yes, sir. Um, one question is: um, Can you run update statistics at any time? Does if the system is up and going, um, and you realize that you're having some problems with parameter sniffing or something like that, can you run it during the day? Uh, I mean, you you can. That's what auto update statistics is going to do. If you hit that tipping point during the day, it's going to update statistics during the day. Okay. Um, but typically, I mean, there is a cost associated with it. You know, I say I like it you know, done nightly. Most of my clients are 24 by 7 or they have some non-peak time where we're looking to um, you know, do a little index maintenance. And while we're doing the index maintenance, if the statistic has been modified or the, the data has been modified, we want to update the statistics. Um, but middle of the day during peak time, I mean, it depends. I mean, if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the lesser evil is to update statistics to uh, you know, fix a potential problem, then sure, that cost is less than having uh, you know, a, a horrific plan. But I mean, you're really getting kind of fine tooth um, you know, there. Well, and as and a sort of a follow-on question, um, this user wanted to know if you have a generous downtime window, uh, would you recommend updating stats with full scan nightly to get the best possible plans you can have? Uh, let, me, let me get back to that one because, I mean, that, that's a, a can of worms. Um, I mean, it, it's one of those that depends. Um, but, I mean, to, to do a full scan, I mean, if it's not needed, I mean, but you have the the I.O. available and the, the generous maintenance window, I mean, it's it's not evil. It's not going to um, be horrible. I mean, it, it could potentially you know, uh, do good. Um, but again, you're doing a lot of work that doesn't need to be done. I mean, if, this, if the data hasn't changed and the statistics are up to date, why, why visit them again? Um, but again, it's not going to hurt you know, if you have the maintenance window. Okay. And then one more. Uh, we've got some others, but I know you can't go on and stay on statistics forever. Uh, can you, um, if you need a specific solution, can you um, update statistics on just um, um, an index um, and and just do that one index instead of the entire file? Does that cause any problems? No, you can't update just certain statistics, um, which is kind of you know, fairly common on you know, you know, hot tables or indexes where um, you, know, you just want to you know, update that one area. Because, I mean, there's cases where um, you know, updating statistics you know, in general can cause you know, some, some bad, and you need to j just update uh, you know, certain statistics. So, yes, there are, there are you know, situations where um, that is done. I mean, you just specify which... Uh, which ones that you want, throw it in a job or manually, uh, but yes, you can absolutely do that. Okay. There's a lot of whole host more, but we'll never finish the session. If we, uh, we'll have some time at the end, um, and uh, we'll try to go back, and I'll try to make sure Tim either answers all of these, or if he has to leave, uh, he can blog about them later on. Okay. So you can go ahead.
right. they generated so about ten questions. <laughs> wow. All right, so we, we kind of hit on statistics and I, I talked about index maintenance you know, a little bit on the statistics slide. Uh, unfortunately, with you know, SQL Server, there is no you know, auto defrag, auto you know, do index maintenance kind of you know, procedure. So if you're not doing anything, then nothing is being done. And you know, fragmentation is real. You know, data modification, such as inserts, updates, and deletes, you know, cause fragmentation. Um, so really nothing that happens in your server, right? I mean, how many of us have inserts, updates, and deletes? Um, so it's, it's kind of like wear and tear on your automobile. It, it's going to happen, uh, and we have to perform maintenance. Microsoft did a, a white paper. Now, this is dated. It's back in the SQL Server 2000 days, but it's all still pretty much relevant. Uh, they took various size workloads, various size databases, different types of hardware, different levels of fragmentation to try to simulate what impact fragmentation has on a SQL Server workload. And what they found was kind of astounding. You know, anywhere from 13% to 460% based on the size of the environment and the fragmentation level. And I included the TechNet, TechNet uh, link you know, to that article. It's really a good read if you've never looked at it. So think about that. If you encountered a, an environment that had been around for uh, or in existence for a couple of years, and you went and looked at the index fragmentation, you'd probably find that every index is 90% plus fragmented. Now, if you just went and rebuilt all those indexes, you could potentially have a 460% improvement in performance. I mean, that's, that's like raise, you know, bonus, title change you know, type of um, you know, work. I mean, it'd be like you increasing the, you know, moving to solid state disk or uh, quadrupling the size of the, 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 the memory. I mean, massive change to that environment. Now, I always thought that, you know, yeah, these are just numbers. That's a, uh, a rare case. Um, you know, constructed in a lab just for the sake of, of producing numbers until I was working with a client several years ago. And we migrated their, their storage to a new server, <clears throat> trying to improve performance. We... Uh, enabled compression in uh, some of the environment and or some of the tables and again you know, no real improvement and then we noticed that statistics and um, you know, index maintenance was not being performed now we were called in just to do the heavy lifting to, to move move the data not to do a health assessment or uh, you know, anything of the instance so while our hand, hands were kind of idle we just started kind of poking around and looking at things and, and noticed those and uh, revealed to the client hey we would like to do these things. We implemented Ola's uh, maintenance solution, and the next night, um, basically got a phone call that we broke the environment because their ETL process went from like 14 hours to two. Uh, come to find out, no, the ETL process ran successfully. They just thought the you know, the data didn't load. It validated, and all the data was there. The next night, it ran in less than two hours, and the night after, less than two hours. Um, the, the only change you know, afterwards, I mean, even though we had moved to new storage, we had enabled compression, not, those two things made no difference or very little difference. But statistics and fragmentation you know, reduced the, the load time by over 500%. So, yeah, those, those figures are, are kind of real. Um, so you need to check your environments. If you have you know, high levels of fragmentation, how do we control it? You can rebuild the index. You can reorganize, or you can dis disable and rebuild within a transaction you know, the index. Uh, personally, you know, if it's the first time I'm on the system and fragmentation is really, really high, rebuilds are probably going to be the quickest. Then I like to implement a uh, kind of a smart solution, which, based on the level of fragmentation of the index, it will choose to rebuild or to reorganize. And again, that depends on the addition of SQL Server that I'm running in the client's maintenance window. So if they're 24 by 7 running in standard edition, it's going to be hard to rebuild an index with no impact to their environment. So reorganizations are probably going to be my, my only solution unless they have a, a maintenance window where we can take the database you know, offline or have kind of disrupting uh, you know, maintenance. So you can schedule the rebuild to reorganizations in a maintenance plan. And notice I said rebuild or reorganization. Uh, up to SQL 2014, you can rebuild or you can reorganize. Uh, there's no logic of based on fragmentation levels. 
custom scripts in a SQL agent job, such as Ola Halligren's index optimi optimized script. Uh, based on, you can get very granular based on the number of pages, uh, the level of fragmentation, uh, what you want to do, whether it's reorganize or rebuild. There's third-party tools. There's several that have really nice, pretty graphs and dashboards if you want to pay money. Um, me, I like free. That's my favorite four-letter F word, and Ola's does just that. Um, I have heard in 2016 there's going to be some changes to uh, the maintenance plan, so we can see, uh, hopefully see some uh, kind of logic in there based on fragmentation levels and things like that. So uh, the, the future landscape is changing for um, managing this stuff. Microsoft's recognized you know, that, and uh, we'll be getting some support. But you need to be doing something. You need to uh, be manually you know, controlling the fragmentation level. And if you're not doing it, you should see a pretty substantial improvement in performance once you do. Let me just say one thing. Um, Ola's scripts are fantastic. I'd heard a lot about them, and then a couple of years ago, we decided to start trying to implement them. They, they're, they're marvelous for helping you get fragmentation, statistics, all of this stuff under control. Your backups, everything, they kind of all integrate together. Like Tim said, they're free. <laughs> and they're well documented. They're easy to use. I want to have a session on it one day. Uh, if I can, I've tried to get Ola. He he wouldn't. He he doesn't feel good about doing a virtual uh, session. But I'm I'm going to get somebody to do it one day. Look, so. look at the previous uh, past sessions. I know last year Ola oh, he yeah. did one on his scripts. But the years before, there's been several other people that have gotten up and presented using Ola's scripts. Oh, I mean. So, it's so, worth yeah, it for anybody to look yeah, for. I mean, you know you've made it and you have a good solution when there's other people out there talking, you know, having an hour-long session on how to use your tool. Uh, but yeah, the documentation's out there, all the sample scripts. Um, you know, hit Twitter if you have a question you know, of how to do something. I mean, it's one of the most recognized and used uh, maintenance solutions you know, out there. And like Steve and I both said, it's, it's free, it works. It's won the like the best of um, you know, SQL Tool Award like you know, several years in a row, um, and he maintains it. All right, another area that I see um, not really being taken a, taken advantage of is uh, setting your memory limits. So your max and min values for SQL Server 2008 R2 and below, the minimum default is two petabytes. I mean, excuse me, the max is set to two petabytes, and your minimum is set to zero. So SQL Server will use as little as no memory or as much as anything you can put on, on the server. What this does is sets up the potential for SQL Server to starve the operating system and the operating system to starve SQL Server. Uh, with 2008 R2 and below, max memory applies to the buffer pool only. Now, I have seen a number of systems where uh, the, the memory level seems pretty high. Page life expectancy CPU is, is reading pretty high, but this, the database server's timing out. It's, um, I've heard terms of choppy, laggy, sporadic, um, you know, it, it freezes, and you, just looking at the server uh, kind of quick, you know, uh, IO is pretty good, page life expectancy is good, you know, those things. And come to find out, you start looking in the ring buffers and, and things, and SQL Server is basically in a tug of war with the operating system. You go and you set a max you know, value so that uh, SQL Server, the buffer pool is a little more constrained. Performance just shoots up. The user says everything's great. Page life expectancy is still within uh, a marvelous you know, area. And it was all because you know, SQL Server and the OS were... Um, basically, SQL was starving the operating system. It would take the memory, and then it would have to give it back, and take it, and then give it back. With 2012, the values are still the same, two petabytes and minimum is zero, but there was a complete memory manager redesign. Now, max memory applies to all memory manager allocations, and I've heard that we can consider letting SQL Server now dynamically manage you know, the memory. It, it's been difficult to find the, the true documentation on it, but the session that I was in, uh, basically said that you know, SQL Server is set to only use up to 90% of the available memory. All right, so if you say you had a, a terabyte, so it would use 900 gigabytes of memory. If it got to 900 and SQL Server was still kind of uh, under memory pressure, it would look and see how much memory is still available to the operating system. So if the OS is using 20 gig, there's 80 gig left. 
SQL Server would take up to 50% of the available memory, so another 40 gigabytes, and then it could no longer, it couldn't uh, grab any more memory. Um, like I said, I heard that in the session. I haven't seen it. You, you really documented. Uh, when I ask, most folks within Microsoft still state that they would set the max memory value. Uh, we we still recommend it just as a safety um, safety net. Uh, definitely, if you're running multiple instances on SQL, uh, SQL Server on a server, you want to set max values uh, so that you don't have SQL competing against SQL competing against the operating system. But it, it was extremely uh, kind of strange to see the negative behavior of SQL Server when SQL and the OS are competing for uh, memory. So out of the box, um, you can Google, uh, take a look at... Um, um, or, or do a Bing search on how much memory does my SQL Server need. It will direct you to Jonathan Cahias's blog, or just go and look up Jonathan Cahias SQL Server memory. And he's got an excellent formula to determine you know, what you should start off with um, as your max value. Um, but the key is you know, set it to something. Um, you know, use Jonathan's uh, formula, and then you want to manage the m bytes available memory counter and make sure that uh, you. Know, you still have between 150 to 300 megabytes for the OS. Uh, Aaron Stiletto and I'll both still like to say maybe a gigabyte. You know, that's what you're comfortable with, and then you can monitor that because if you start off with a server with uh, 256 gig of RAM, you give 212 to SQL Server, leaving about 40 gig or so to the OS. If you notice the, you still constantly always have 20 gig available to the OS. We know you can give. Uh, you know, a lot more to SQL Server. Maybe start with 15 gig and kind of work your way down until you get to a, um, a healthy value where the OS isn't starved, but SQL Server still has as much as it can. So questions on um, memory settings? Yes, um, and I kind of, I think I know the answer to this. Uh, one person asked, is SQL Server the only thing installed? Is there a reason to set min, uh, minimum memory? And I think there should be because you got to have some room for the system functions, but go ahead. Well, for minimum, um, that where if SQL Server is a dedicated SQL Server, there's nothing else running on it. Why set minimum that min right. memory? All right. Yeah. Why just, not? Yeah. It, it's it really comes down to why not? Um, do I always no? If it's a dedicated server for SQL Server, if it's running SSIS, guess what? It's not dedicated SQL Server. If it's running SSRS, it's not dedicated SQL Server. This, yeah, um, I've seen where a, a ETL developer deployed an ETL package running some C-sharp code, and it went rogue and starved SQL Server, where SQL Server was unresponsive. Although it was a dedicated SQL Server, and, but it was also running SSIS. Um, it's rare. I mean, I've only heard of that in, in one occurrence, but that was one occurrence enough to let me know Really? Well, if I'm already in there setting max, why not, and I've got 64 gig, why not just set it to 16 or 30% of the available uh, just as a, as a safety net? You know, we do so much other for SQL Server for what ifs and HA and DR and you know, trying to protect it. And that one little setting in the you know, one in a million chance that you know, your dedicated SQL Server might have something run rogue, it's, it's a safety net. If it's a shared server, absolutely you need it. But, yeah, I, I get the why set it if it's dedicated, and, and that's the why, because why not? Okay. I'm not sure about this. Is there a Microsoft article that documents the M new memory management? I don't know if that's something in 2016 I don't know about yet. or. Well, in, unless they're just talking about the, the memory manager rewrite in 2012. And yes, there's a lot of information out there. Okay. And um, this person is asking about the formula to find out how much to leave for the OS, also relating to the other functions. And I think the article you were talking about from Jonathan Cahiss, which that, that was great. I, I looked at that too, um, would be the answer to that. Um, and, and I'll get that added to the slide before I send it to you. So I'll have it listed on the default memory settings. Good deal. I think that'd be good because I went through that and my boss said, hey, I think we need to do this with all our servers because I was trying to recommend something on one server. Yeah, and uh, so I think the question they were asking, if you're running IS, AS, you know, RS you know, on the 
that instance, you know, what would you start with if it's not a dedicated SQL Server? And it comes back to, well, it, you know, what is going to be the workload of IS and AS and RS? And whatever you see that workload, then back off. So just go in more conservative, then manage that n bytes available memory counter. You can have a you know a perf mine collection, grab it every you know, five seconds, minute, you know, just log it um, and go and look and see what your your average is. And if you see it consistently stays above you know, a value, then you know that you can allocate more memory to SQL Server. So it it comes down to what you're comfortable with and knowing the environment, and then continuing to to monitor because if you start adding more and more uh, IS jobs you know, to it, then it may need more resources and you have to decrease that max value. So it, it's a never-ending chore um, to make sure that uh, you know, SQL Server has the memory that it needs and it's not starving the OS. Okay, this one person has a question about does a SQL, virtualized SQL environment affect the memory settings in any no. way? Okay. No, I mean... <clears throat> For this, no. Uh, virtualization, does it change in you know, how we're concerned about memory? Absolutely. If at the hypervisor la level you have ballooning going on, they're oversubscribing, you have other memory issues to be concerned about. Um, but these recommendations that we're going through are for physical or virtual. Um, and I've heard this before too. This, question, this person has a question as to whether or not having the minimum and maximum set to the same value uh, is the preferred way of doing things? Uh, not preferred. We, we typically recommend, you know, if you're going to set a min value about 30% um, of the memory, if you set the min and max to the same, um, if it was a virtual server and it was ballooned or the, or the OS needed to page you know, SQL Server to get uh, some memory and it couldn't, you could very well have a blue screen. Um. Okay, I'll handle that. That's just Jonathan's name. Um, okay, there's some other small ones, but we'll take care of those at the end. All right. So next we get into um, default max degree of parallelism and cost threshold for parallelism. And fortunately, this is a little more cut and dry. And out of the box, default is set to zero, meaning an unlimited number of CPUs can be used to execute the parallel region of a query. Microsoft has you know, come out and, and uh, recommended that if you have eight CPUs or eight or more, start with eight and then you can modify from there. Uh, if you have eight or fewer processors, you can use zero to n, meaning you know, n being up to the number of uh, you know, processors. And that's logical or physical. And I included the link. Um, so the, the way I kind of like to you know, help people understand parallelism is think about if you're having to cut a, a small front yard, um, maybe an acre, which, or let's say it's a you know, 200 foot by 200 foot you know, piece of grass. And uh, you get out there with a push mower, and let's just say for math's sake, it would take you one hour to start in one corner and cut the entire lot. If you called three of your buddies and they all came over with a, a push mower and you started in the four corners and you started cutting the grass, it would take 25% of the time. So uh, say you have 15 buddies, and 15 come over, and they all have push mowers. So now it's a 16 CPU server. And those 16, you, uh, you and your 15 buddies, all 16 of you go and try to start cutting the grass. Is it going to take you, you know, 1 16th of the time? No. You're going to be cutting over the same grass that's already been cut. You're going to be in each other's way. You're going to queue up for making turns, and you're, going to, you're just going to be in each other's way. It's going to be more costly for the 16 of you to do it than it'd be for four or eight of you to do it. So parallelism with high number of CPUs you know, could, you know, could create more work than, than using fewer. Uh, so that's kind of where we're getting into as you know, the CPU core densities and things have increased, you know, having that unlimited number of CPUs can be um, more problematic than uh, than having a, a smaller number. And so setting the max degree of parallelism you know, to the Microsoft's recommendation can drastically help with that. Also, your cost threshold for parallelism, that's your query subtree cost. The default value is five. <clears throat> that number five was set many, many, many years ago uh, in a Microsoft lab and the five meant five seconds. So if a query was going to take more than five seconds to execute, then go parallel. 
uh, that five no longer means five seconds. It's an arbitrary number, and it's very, very low with today's you know, high-speed you know, processors, bus, uh, memory. I mean, our servers are just so much better than they were back in the, the early 2000s. My team you know, recommends that this be adjusted between 25 to 50 based on your environment. Again, Kahias has a great article. I included the bit.ly link uh, where you can go in and start digging into the plan cache to find which queries are you know, still going parallel. Uh, you can take those queries and start trying to tweak and tune them, see if they perform better uh, with a max, max dot hint uh, to know whether you can go tune the query itself or whether you can continue to tweak the cost threshold value uh, to uh, a higher number to where those queries that are still going parallel that would be more beneficial with a, um, a max stop hint, then it will help you find what that actual number is you know, for your environment. I've seen some have their max uh, their cost threshold for parallelism value set at as high as 250. Um, so it, it does depend on your environment. Uh, I've you know, using a 25 or 50. I've never seen anyone go down. They've only you know, tweaked it further up. So any questions about the slide? Surprisingly, there weren't any about that. Yeah, that's what I say. I mean, this is kind of cut and dry. I mean, the guidance is there, um, and it, it really just kind of you know, makes sense. And I will say that working with virtualization, most of the, the virtual servers that I work on are 2 vCPU, 4 Z, vCPU, up to about eight. Rarely do I see a virtualized server with more than eight vCPU. I have, but it, it's once we give guidance, that usually gets reduced down. Uh, so in that case, we're already dealing with eight or fewer processors. So setting a max dot value of if it's two vCPU, setting it to two, or if it's four to four, you know, is irrelevant because the zero is the max number of processors, which is below. Um, the, the physical number or the logical number of processors. So it, it's not as critical there. We still, you know, cost threshold for parallelism is vital for the virtual server. Uh, typically, we're having to set max stop on physicals where they're you know, 16, 24, 32, 68, you know, CPUs. I spoke too soon. There's some questions that have come in. Uh, this one I've heard a little bit about. Uh, there's some apps like SharePoint that mandate a max stop of one. Uh, yep. Does the cost of threshold matter there? Um, well, I mean, you're already set to, to one CPU, so I say, yeah, I really haven't thought about with, I mean, you know, I mean it seemed, to me, logically thinking the cost threshold wouldn't matter because it's already you know, maxed up one, so yeah. everything's going to be one processor, so it would be irrelevant. Um, this person wants to know if you change the default settings during production hours, will that cause any issues? This uh, modifying max stop cost threshold min max memory uh, will cause a plan cache flush. Okay. Um, and so maybe a momentary slowdown. Well, I mean, like a second, two seconds. I mean, might see a slight CPU spike, but like with anything, maintenance window. I mean, do it in a better. <laughs> you know, I mean, just CYA. I mean, these things would they require a change control in your environment? In your environment. Technically, possibly yes, because you're modifying the, the config of, of the instance. Um, have I seen these cause major issues with changing during production hours? No, but the, use caution. You be smart. It's been running like this for a very long time. Tweak it after eight o'clock at night, you know, or something you know, during during a maintenance window, just as a, a CYA. Yeah, but, it'd be yeah, a lot better, a, better to be safe than Yeah, but a planned cash flush, I mean, I've seen, I think it was Tim Ford or Lewis Davidson, one of those guys went out and validated and said, you know, I've always heard, you know, never run free proc cash during production. Well, they did it on a high-end production server. They saw a spike in CPU for like one point something seconds. You know, so it's like, yeah, it was not a big deal, but it could have had, you know, same time, could it have had detrimental impact? Possibly. Um, so just use some smarts. Um, don't go willy-nilly changing the stuff in production. Uh, do, yeah, do it after hours. Yeah, that would be a bad bad recommendation. Um, I don't think it affects SQL licensing. I don't think changing no. Microsoft affects it. Okay. No, none of this affects licensing. Okay. Uh, 
do you recommend configuring lock pages in memory? Uh, it, it depends. I mean, I would say if you have, I'm trying to remember the guidance, if it's more than like 32 gig of RAM or 64 gig of RAM, um, OLTP workload, I mean, it, it's, it's a nice to have. Um, we recommend it for some clients, but um, if the, that person wants to email me directly, we can we can discuss their environment and whether it would be of a good benefit. Okay. You should not have from there. Okay. For a max stop of more than eight CPUs after you start at eight, what should you do? What should you look for to know if you should modify it from there? All right, um, and the the link here you know addresses some of that. Okay. Uh, looking at the time, we're at one o'clock, and I have five more slides to. Yeah, we better go on. And and I think you if if they can't email you, you could probably I will send you all the questions because we've had a ton of questions. I mean, you're going okay. over the entire system, so uh, there's going to be a bunch of questions. Yeah, and I will address every question that comes in. So you guys feel free to just load them up, and over the next you know, few days, we'll we'll get through them, and I'll help you get all your answers. Okay. Continue on then. All right. Let's talk about TempDB. Um, uh, this has kind of propagated out you know, quite well over the, the past few years. We are, most of us know that TempDB needs to be sized properly. Um, I think most of us on, on this, this line, this uh, webinar, are production DBAs, so, so we're aware of this, but most of my clients that I come across, uh, unless we've already worked with them before, TempDB is you know, single file, modeled after model, um, and you know, it starts off at a megabyte and has to grow to you know, the gigabytes that it, it is in size. So uh, that's not good. Uh, some characteristics, TempDB is recreated at startup. There's only one TempDB per uh, uh, database per instance. It's modeled after the model database. And my favorite trivia question is it cannot be backed up. So if you ever interview with me, I'm going to ask you how often you should back up TempDB. So no, you, it cannot be backed up. Go try it. So considerations, again, much like with MaxDop, eight cores or less, you want to create equal size data files per the number of cores. So if you have eight vCPU, you want eight you know, data files of equal size. You have four vCPU, you have four files. If you have more than eight cores, you want to start with eight equal size data files and then increase by four files based on contention. And I've got the Microsoft article where Bob Ward came out and finally gave the, the guidance several years ago on number of files per uh, number of cores. You want to enable trace flag 1118 and depending on uh, the contention and the I.O. usage of TempDB, you could place TempDB on faster I.O. Again, if needed. Just because you have some solid state available to you, you may be better off putting a, a user database on the, the um, solid state than TempDB. If TempDB isn't your most I.O. intensive database, then it shouldn't get the fastest speed. If it is heavily uh, I.O. intensive, then you can look to uh, split the data files across different lines or put on your know, faster disk, again, if needed. You want to look at your um, system file stats to see you know, where your heaviest I.O. is. So any questions on TempDB? Uh, there was a question about trace flag 1117 also. So 1117 grows each file at the same time, so when a a TempDB file has to grow, it will grow all um, seven in that, in that same file group, but that is instance level. So that would impact any database you know, on the instance. Um, so if you have other databases that have multiple files and file groups, say one is for non-clustered indexes or for archive data, and one of the files in the file group have to grow, they're all going to grow by the same size. So we don't recommend that as always. It's one of those it depends. Um, However, in 2016, that is now enabled, or 117 and 118 are enabled by default for TempDB only. So it's, in certain situations, you may need it, but that's usually very high in uh, I.O. intense. Um, and for the, the general purpose, most systems don't need 1117 enabled. Okay. Um, so basically, if... When it, with that, it depends if you can't do it for the instance level below 2016, uh, then you really can't keep TempDB 
equal. No, I mean, it should be auto growing. You, know, I mean, it, it's going to you know grow file one, file two. They should kind of keep in sync. Uh, but in some cases, you may have some you know, wild workload that's just going to pin one file, and you may come into a situation where you need one 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 seven enabled. Uh, for the most part, it's not the behavior. TempDB is going to auto grow, or the files are going to grow as needed at the same or in order. Um, and you're not going to need 1117. But you know, certain circumstances, you would need it. And I mean, you can hit SQL Skills you know, blogs, you know, attempt to be. Paul Randall covers that very heavily. Oh, yes. Um, this One more question here, uh, and this goes to uh, where the TempDB files are stored. If it's on a physical TempDB, data files are located on the same physical spindle. Uh, shouldn't they be spread out if it's physical? If it's virtual, how does that affect it? So again, it depends on the I/O. Um, if TempDB is you know, heavily I/O intensive and it's your uh, just being, you know, uh, I mean, say your your file latency is you know, 50 milliseconds you know, each, and you can spread that across you know, other disks to kind of uh, level that out, then. Yes, that would be a good thing. You know, physical, virtual, I mean, it really doesn't you know, matter. Uh, it comes down to the I.O., um, your file latency, and in many cases, all the storage is coming from the same storage pool, so still spreading it out across four lines that's from the same storage pool, it's got the same I.O. Um, um, availability. So, I mean, it, it gets down to, you know, how much I.O. Uh, you know, bandwidth do you have, you know, how much is uh, what what the latency is with TempDB, and can you spread it out across additional you know, disk? Um, you know, sometimes you can get, if it's I/O intensive, get a a disk from different storage pools to kind of spread that out. But it it really comes down to you working with your storage admin um, or your virtualization admin if you're seeing that TempDB is you know, I/O bound. Okay. Well, we can go on. There's still a few left, but uh, we'll never get finished if we don't go on. <laughs> uh, the other thing, SQL Server uh, Agent Alerts. This is free. Uh, it provides proactive monitoring. You only need database mail enabled, and you want to configure a mail operator that sends alerts to a distribution group. You don't want it to just go to you if, you're, if there's more than uh, just you as a DBA in, in your organization. Uh, you want somebody else to be able to get the alerts so you can take a vacation or go on holiday. So. Uh, agent alerts, severity 19 through 25 are all fatal errors, means something occurred and a uh, transaction was uh, rolled back. Uh, 825, which is related to an I.O. operation retry, means SQL Server tried to write uh, some data and it couldn't and it had to retry and uh, was successful. You could also enable 823 and 824, which uh, relates to an I.O. operation failure. Agents can be created using the GUI or a T-SQL script. Um, I like to have this as part of a SQL Server build, and here's a bit.ly link to a step-by-step -step process. Glenn Berry has uh, a really great article and a blog post where he goes into more about agent alerts and includes a, a few additional ones. At the minimum, 19 through 25 and uh, 825 you know, are needed. If you step through using the GUI before you hit uh, go or apply or OK, whatever the message box is, you can say script to a new window, and then you, you now have the code that you can execute on all of your other servers that would have your mail operator and everything uh, you configured. Again, make it part of your standard SQL Server build, have it go to a distribution group, that way when new people come and go, you can just add them to the uh, distribution group, and you're having your uh, email administrator take care of that for you. Again, free, proactive monitoring, knowing these things are going on before your end users have to notify you. That's what our job should be. Um, not just doing business after hours. Questions on agent alerts? Mm. No. Good. All right, balance power. Uh, this one's kind of fun. I remember uh, Mr. Ozar in the Years and years ago, with I think it was uh, Stack Exchange, they went and migrated over to brand new, state of the art, just awesome, awesome hardware, and their performance dropped massively. Um, 
you know, looking at it, trying to figure out, they finally came across that these really nice high dollar CPUs that they bought were running in the megahertz level instead of the gigahertz level. It turned out power savings was enabled on the servers. So uh, you know, power savings and things are great. I mean, my laptop, if I had my laptop configured for high performance, the battery would probably last an hour if I was running some, some heavy workloads. Um, I mean, it's an i7, 3 gigahertz you know, machine. I have balanced power enabled, you know, trying to uh, you know, save power so my battery lasts like 8 or 10 hours. And then if I go and look at CPU, uh, CPU ID or CPU Z, it will show me on most cases I'm using about you know, anywhere from 6 to 900 megahertz to, to run my laptop if I'm just doing you know, email and, and things like that. There's no reason for me to have you know, an i7, 3 gigahertz you know, processor running that hot for email. Your servers in your data center running SQL Server, <clears throat> you know, the, it, it kind of makes sense try to save power, you know, burn less uh, you know, electricity, but SQL Server is not conducive to the balanced power behavior. Um, when the workload comes in, you know, it, it needs the CPU right then and there, and the, the ramp up to you know, bring those CPUs back online to get them you know, at the right clock speed uh, just doesn't really work well with the, the way SQL Server you know, behavior is. So we need the power savings to be in high performance. That means our CPUs aren't going to be underclocked, uh, memory slots aren't going to be powered down, you know, things like that. Um, in some cases, you'll need to have your uh, sys engineer go and disable this in the, in the BIOS. So you want to disable the power savings in BIOS as well. When it comes to virtualization, you need those hosts to be disabled in the BIOS. Um, like I said, I mentioned the free tool, cpuid.com. Website may look a little shady. It's legit. You download the tool. You don't even have to install it. It downloads a zip file. Just grab the cpuid.exe you know, out of it or the, the executable and just run it. And you know, other things that power settings uh, can do is disabling your NIC. I mean, it can turn the NIC off when uh, if it doesn't see any activity coming to it. And, you know, that could be a really bad thing, especially if it's a, the NIC on a failover cluster. To balance power, great for your laptops, you know, maybe the LED light bulbs in your house, but balance power for your, your high-dollar database servers that you're spending top dollar for the, the you know, high gigahertz CPUs, not worth it. So in summary, you know, we, we discussed SQL Server is great. I mean, it's fantastic. Make, you know, hopefully we're all employed working on it. But a next, next, next finish install you know, is not so good. You know, we need to have proper backups. You need to be running regular consistency checks. We need to perform log cleanups for MSDB and our SQL Server log. We need to have up-to-date statistics and proper index maintenance. You need proper memory settings so it's not a tug of war between the OS and SQL Server. Configure max stop and cost threshold for parallelism so your server's not just so busy dividing and up workload and reconstructing it. TempDB needs to be configured properly for your instance. What I didn't mention you know, going through talking about with TempDB is if it starts at a megabyte and has to grow you know, by 10% or 1 meg each time and it has to get to several gigabytes, you know, just like with user databases, when a data file has to grow, the transactions are suspended. So this is for your entire instance. And so if you've ever noticed that when you restart SQL Server, it's just very sporadic behavior you know, for a while after it's restarted. It could be due to temp to be having to you know, grow back to its normal uh, work size. You want to configure SQL Server agent alerts. Again, free proactive monitoring. And then turn off any power savings uh, that you may have within your BIOS and within your, um, your Windows um, operating system. So that's all I had. It's approaching 15 after. I know we have um, some additional questions, which I'm happy to uh, have Steve email those to me, and I'll reply back to the group. Uh, I wrote down a couple of links to include, uh, such as Kahias's blog on um, how much memory does my SQL Server need. And so I'll include that in the slide deck and get that off to Steve in the next few minutes uh, so he can get that out to everyone who registered for today's webinar. Thank you, Tim. This this was great. I mean, it's it's everything that a that a beginning or intermediate DBA needs to 
set up a, a like you said a, a standard SQL build and uh, the scripts and 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 you've got the links with the documentation that uh, once we get this uploaded I would suggest everybody go back through this again and just just digest this stuff and go to the links and understand it and um, anyway um, thank you it was great um, be aware that uh, we will be having session Let's see, October the 12th, uh, uh, November the 9th, and November the 10th. And uh, you'll be getting that in our email, and I'll let you know when uh, the session is uploaded and with the scripts or, or the, the slides. Um, I don't guess there will be any scripts associated with this, but uh, we'll have the slides uploaded. And thanks again, Tim, and we'll see you next month. All right. Thank you all for having me. Bye. That was great. Um, you've got a ton of questions to answer, so um, I, I guess this, a, a session like this would generate tons of questions because you're recovering a little bit of everything at a higher level. Uh, but I'll send these to you um, uh, as soon as I get off the session. We'll print the stuff out. There'll be 40 or 50 of them. I tried to go through them and digest them and try to get one or two that kind of dealt more with what you were talking about at the time. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you have to deal with this every time you give this session too because it does cover so much. Yeah, and you know, a lot of the questions are the same, but you know, occasionally I get um, you know, new questions and if it's something I'm not 100 percent, you know, I, I don't like to try to answer you know, or speculate, um, so that's why I, I you defer some of them, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I love this session because you know, as you saw through the questions, people are asking about their specific environment. Yes. And and that's what makes it so great is then they can go back and with confidence do what they know they can do. You know, because you, you heard you know a lot of them. Well, do we need to set max their min memory? Well, no, not really. But you know, why not? And so if somebody had had balked at them and said, well, you don't need to set it, and they can go back. Well. Tim with SQL skills and what they recommend is, you know, why not? Because in some cases it could have a problem, and here's why. And they're like, well, yeah, it does make sense. So it doesn't hurt to set it. And you know, it's just you need confirmation occasionally, sometimes for something that you already know. And so that, that's and what I we're think here he, for. Yeah, and I think that's what he, I think that particular question. I think he knew it. He just wanted to get an expert saying yes or no. Yeah. But well, this was a lot of fun. I, I, the max number I saw, because um, yeah, once I got to talking, I really wasn't looking at the attendees that much, was like 314. So I don't know if you had, if it, if you have a tool that tells you what the the max number was at whatever point. Yeah, it'll it'll probably go a little bit above that. Uh, I'm guessing about 320 or so. That's a very good session, though. I always love it when they get above 300. We try to keep our average there, but it doesn't always stay there. Yeah. <laughs> Well, what I'm going to do is um, probably send you, a, I know that in your SQL skills, I think Paul's done a couple, I think Kimberly has, I know Aaron has, Glenn has, I have, um, that yeah, it, it would be neat if you could go back and look you know, month over month and um, look and see what are the, the same folks that attend every month versus new, you know, what's, what's the delta between month over month, so uh, I know with us, I mean, this is you know, cost SQL skills, you know, because we're on the on the clock, and but it's you know, you know, great to do for the community, and you know, helps get get us out there. But you know, if we're just hitting the same 300 people every time, you know, it, it might be a harder sell to you know, just keep coming back and just. Um, but if it's a on average 100 different, you know, 100 new people or different people month over month, <clears throat> then. It's like, hey, yeah, we need to hit fill up your calendar next year with you know, six more sessions. Well, what I'll do is I'll go back and do that because I'm sure Paul is looking at it. He wants to he wants to see 
new people that he's introduced himself to, and that's why he was doing that to all the sessions across the board. Right. Uh, part of it is we do have the, the Australian chapter that will be going to different and new people. He's already doing one for them, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. They're actually not a separate chapter, but they're sort of autonomous to us. Uh, mm -hmm. We just sort of advertise them. But what we'll do uh, is I'll go back and do that and see if I can see the differences between the two. I should be able to, I, should, I think they keep the, the statistics out there for about two years, should be able to go back in and try to come up with something like that and present it to Paul, because I really love your sessions. Um, they're fantastic. Yeah, and, and we really enjoy doing them, and I'll tell you, I mean, 320 people, that's me doing 12 to 15 other user group presentations to reach that many people. So you're a are, are one of our biggest audience, you know, which is really all of the virtual chapters. Um, you know, we get larger attendees than we do, say, speaking at the Chicago session remotely, or um, you know, the you know, Edenton and you know the, the different ones. Because you know, a regular user group, they may have you know, 12 to 20 people you know, come out. So I'd have to do 15 of those to get 300 people. You know. One, one sitting, I mean, an hour and a half, I just presented to 320 people. Um, that's awesome you know, for me for uh, MVP renewal and, and things like that. Um, so I definitely want to keep, you know, keep doing them you know, with you. But I also uh, you know, think if you can show the return on investment on, hey, Paul, you guys are getting, you know, on average, you know, 50 new people you know, each time that, that you present, you're like, Wow, yeah, we need to, to keep supporting you and your group. Now that SQL Century is your sponsor, they're a partner of ours, it just makes sense for SQL Skills to um, still support you, you know, pretty heavily. Well, that sounds good because I can tell you just personally, uh, the sessions that you guys have given for us, I have went back and, and learned so much from that. Uh, when Glenn gave his one on the DMVs, it was it was it was just opening my eyes to a whole new area that I'd never really dealt with very much. I'm not a, I'm, I guess I'm maybe an intermediate DBA. I'm not even a, I was a beginning DBA when this uh, chapter first started up. So I'm not, so I learn as I go. So uh, some of my answers may sound like that when I'm, uh, when I'm talking to you or, or going back and forth. Uh, and I'm, but I'm, I'm way ahead of what I used to be. Uh, but anyway, we'll, I'll go back and go through that and uh, try to. Oh, our mic is live. People have been telling me that, but uh, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything bad. Um, anyway, uh, I don't guess there's any really way to. When we're still going, there's no way to turn it off. But uh, I will try to get that information together and try to show it to Paul and Kimberly, and because we'd love to have y'all back, definitely. Well, I enjoy doing it. Yeah, there's still 100 people there. That means there's some of them that were not uh, not listening real closely and know that the session's over. I'll tell you what, though, that time that we had the problem with uh, with Aaron's um, uh, presentation, at the end of it, she finally said, I'm going to drive back home and see if maybe the cable's on by now because we couldn't do it at the... Uh, so I'm, I'm giving away the story. <laughs> we couldn't do it at the um, at the Internet Cafe. People, I mean, we lost about 10 people while she took 15 minutes to try to drive home and see if it was it was working again. So it was amazing how many people wanted to stay and listen. But anyway, I'll get that information together and try to present it to Paul and Kimberly and see if we can have you back next year. Sounds good. Okay. And I appreciate today's session. It was fantastic. I appreciate y'all. Talk to you later. Bye.